Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Dispelling USP-800 Myths, a logical approach to staff safety when handling hazardous drugs. I am Aliyah Pavla with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. We will also have a series of audience polling questions during today's webinar. When we reach each poll slide, the poll question will pop up automatically on your screen. Our speakers will give a few seconds for you to select an answer from the options on your screen and you can click submit. Thank you in advance for your participation. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing Richard Green. Richard is the Director of Radio Pharmacy Practice at Cardinal Health Nuclear and Precision Health Solutions, which prepares and dispenses more than 40,000 patient doses of radio pharmaceuticals every day. In his role, Rich leads the clinical services group and is responsible for establishing quality benchmarks, followed by a group of more than 500 radio pharmacists and 800 nuclear pharmacy technicians, operating 131 nuclear pharmacies in 45 states. Rich is heavily involved in evaluating investigational new drug opportunities and developing and testing shipping and shielding solutions, solving the practical issues in radio pharmacy practice. Rich began his career on the bottom rung of the radio pharmacy ladder as a driver in radio pharmacy making deliveries to hospital and clinics, where he was obviously bitten by the nuclear bug. As a result, he pursued a career in nuclear pharmacy, graduating from the University of Arizona in 1988 with a Bachelor's of Science degree in pharmacy. He has managed radio pharmacies in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Phoenix, Arizona, and managed the first commercial pet cyclotron radio pharmacy in the country. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Rich to begin today's presentation. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. We're here today to talk about USP Chapter 800, which sets standards for the safe handling of hazardous drugs in the healthcare settings. It's an important topic because each year, more than 8 million healthcare workers in the U.S. are potentially exposed to hazardous medications. The USP 800 standards are set to go into effect December 1, 2019, not too far away. So now is the perfect time to clear up some key misconceptions about them and to help you prepare for compliance. Before we get started, let me provide just a bit of background about Cardinal Health. We're a global, integrated healthcare com solutions company that helps customers and patients navigate all the complexity and change in healthcare today. That includes more than delivering products and services to providers everywhere. It also means delivering information on such key topics as the changing safety standards for the handling of hazardous drugs. That's why we're all here today. We'll cover three main objectives today. First, we'll focus on two key sections of USP 800, including what they mean and why they're important. Second, we'll unravel some common myths about USP 800. And third, we'll help you develop a roadmap for achieving compliance with these standards. To help us address all three objectives, I'd like to introduce two clinical experts. Patty Keenly is the Director of Accreditation and Medication Safety for Cardinal Health Innovative Delivery Solutions. She is currently a member of the USP Compounding Expert Committee and chairs the subcommittee on hazardous drugs. Patty has authored many publications to help healthcare practitioners better understand and comply with USP standards, including the Chapter 800 Answer Book. Karen Kellogg is the Director of Pharmacy Practice, uh, Director of Practice Consulting for Healthcare Specialty Solutions. 
She has more than 30 years of pharmacy experience and has held a broad range of positions in acute care, outpatient care, and healthcare consulting. Karen is a nationally recognized expert in physician in-office dispensing, and one of her areas of focus is helping physician practices comply with USP 800 standards. Welcome to you both, ladies. Glad to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Well, let's get started by talking about the difference between USP and USP 800. Patty, could you explain that for us? Sure. USP stands for the United States Pharmacopeia Convention. It's a scientific, nonprofit organization that sets standards for drug safety and quality used not only in the U.S., but in more than 140 other countries. USP 800 is a specific general chapter of USP standards that addresses safe handling of hazardous drugs in healthcare settings. That chapter outlines quality of practice standards for handling hazardous drugs that promote the safety of patients, the environment, and also healthcare personnel who are daily exposed to these drugs. So you might want to say, well, where can exposure to the drugs occur and who might be at risk? So maybe we can take a closer look. Where can these occur? And these are, it's important to note that these are examples. So these aren't exclusive, but these are certainly the key examples of where these things occur. So exposure to hazardous drug can occur at all kinds of healthcare settings, pharmacies, hospitals, other healthcare institutions, patient treatment clinics, physician practice facilities, and veterinarian offices, for example. And there's lots of us as healthcare workers who could be exposed and risk of exposure. So that could include pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, nurses, physicians, physician assistants, home health care workers, veterinarians, and veterinary technicians. You can find a lot of this information in Section 1 of the USP standards for more information. Thanks, Patty. Now let's turn our attention to two key sections of USP 800 and what they mean. The first section, the first selection, is from Sections 5.1 and 5.2 which deal with the handling and storage of hazardous drugs. Remember, USP 800 applies to more than just compounding. To emphasize that point, let's take a closer look at that part of USP 800 that discusses activities involving hazardous drugs that are outside of the pharmacy. Section 5.1 overviews how to safely receive hazardous drugs. According to USP 800 standards, you should clearly label containers containing antineoplastic hazardous drugs so they can be easily identified. These drugs should be unpacked in an appropriate area that contains them by managing air pressures. Personnel should also wear the proper gloves at all times when handling hazardous drugs. Section 5.2 discusses the storage of these drugs. Most importantly, antineoplastic hazardous drugs must be stored separately from other non-hazardous drugs. Now, why am I pointing out these two sections? Because safe handling standards begin now, begin how and when hazardous drugs are received, not just when they arrive in the IV room for compounding. As I just mentioned, one example of how to address this is to identify and label separate totes for chemotherapy drugs upon receipt. Now let's move on to our second selection from USP 800 standards. Karen, which one would you like to discuss? So next, let's focus on Section 7. That's Personal Protective Equipment, or PPE. PPE provides worker protection to reduce exposure to hazardous drug aerosols and residues. Additionally, you'll need to wear PPE not just when compounding and administering hazardous drugs, but in any time you're in contact with them. That also includes during receipt, storage, transportation, deactivation and decontamination, cleaning and disinfecting, spill control, and waste disposal. The need for PPE during all of these steps is often overlooked and can put your staff members at risk of exposure. Let's continue clearing up this misconception about USP 800 and talk about some of the most common myths surrounding the standards. Let's start with myth number one, my personal favorite. 
USP 800 provides guidelines. USP 800 does not provide guidelines. This is a myth because the word guidelines implies that USP 800 provides suggestions, good ideas, things you could follow if you wanted to or not. These are standards. In reality, USP 800 sets standards that are enforceable by regulators and accreditation organizations. Now let's move on to myth number two. Products are approved by USP 800 for use. USP 800 does not approve products for use. USP has no regulatory authority over the manufacturing, marketing, and use of PPE products. It does set standards that apply to the safe handling of hazardous drugs, which are then enforced by accreditation and regulatory bodies. That's right, Rich. USP develops practice and quality standards for healthcare settings. They don't regulate the manufacturing and marketing of those medical products. So you shouldn't see things listed as USP approved, for example, since not U that's not USP's role. USP does provide a framework for PPE selection that's based on the activities you're performing. The framework is more specific for some PPE categories than others. For example, there's a requirement to use gloves that meet particular testing standards to protect healthcare workers during the compounding or administering of chemotherapy. The sole purpose of USP 800 is to provide standards for the safe handling of hazardous drugs to minimize the risk of exposure to healthcare personnel, patients, and the environment. So let's move on to our next myth. Myth number three is that the focus on handling hazardous drugs is new. Well, the focus of ha on handling hazardous drugs is not new. The truth is that USP 800 language has been available for several years. The information is not new, and we've known about this for quite a long time. The difference is, is that it will soon be enforceable, and that will start on December 1, 2019. USP 800 was published more than three and a half years ago, on February 1, 2016, and even before that it had two public comment versions that we all had the opportunity to comment on. So it's not new and shouldn't be considered a surprise to anyone. In fact, discussions around safe handling of hazardous drugs date back to the 1970s in the medical literature. There's more recent information from OSHA the National, and from NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and they provide a list of hazardous drugs. And in addition to that, there's prominent healthcare organizations, the professional organizations that we all depend on, that have had guidance documents for years. They include the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, or ASHP, Oncology Nursing Society, ONS, and even physician groups such as the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Concerns about the safe handling of hazardous drugs have been around for years, and chemotherapy drugs have been a major focus. But are chemo drugs the only ones classified by NIOSH as hazardous? Why don't we make that our first polling question? Audience members can select their response, true or false, and we'll see what we get from the audience. Select your response and hit submit. It seems like the audience is very clear on that, that they've read USP 800 and realized that this is a myth Hazardous drugs do not apply just to chemotherapy. Great, you've done your homework. The term hazardous drugs does not apply just to chemotherapy. Chemotherapy drugs aren't the only ones classified as hazardous by NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, a division of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC. In fact, there are three major categories of drugs that NIOSH classifies as hazardous. Heidi, can you explain this further for our audience? Sure, but let's start with the most basic question of all. What makes a drug hazardous? Drugs considered hazardous 
include those that exhibit one or more of the following characteristics, either in human or animals. And I tend to think of these as the first five things that are listed here. Carcinogenicity, teratogenicity, reproductive toxicity, organ toxicity at low doses, and genotoxicity. But then we have a sixth category because new drugs come out all the time, so we need some way to classify them. So new drugs that come out, if they have a structure or toxicity profile that's similar to existing drugs that are already classified as hazardous drugs, well, we need to consider them as hazardous as well. So that's the basic definition of what a hazardous drug is. But then there's three categories of hazardous drug that Rich mentioned a moment ago. So these are examples of the tables that are used in the NIOSH lists. The drugs that are, we are talking about here are those that are hazardous to us as healthcare professionals. This is a different situation from the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA list of hazardous materials, those, some of which are drugs, and they're hazardous to the environment. So it's very important. It's just that's not what the focus is of 800. A little bit of confusing piece is that there are some drugs that are on both the NIOSH list and the EPA list of hazardous materials. But the NIOSH list sorts hazardous drugs, so those that are hazardous to us as healthcare professionals, into three tables. And we have some examples, and they're just examples, of the large number of drugs that are on this list. So let's take a look at table one. These are the antineoplastics. So we generally think of these antineoplastic drugs as the chemo drugs, and they include those that we've known about concerns for decades. The drugs in this category certainly remain a major focus, but there's other drugs that have been identified as hazardous as well. And NIOSH splits them into tables two and three. So table two are non-antineoplastic drugs that meet one or those criteria that I just talked about. So there are other toxicities that are mentioned that aren't antineoplastics. And then table three are the drugs on the hazardous drug list that are there only because they pose a reproductive risk. And that risk could be to men or women. Now, looking at table one and the antineoplastics, when we think of chemotherapy, a lot of time we think of just the IV chemotherapy, but this list also contains tablets, capsules, and some hormonal, hormonal therapies as well. Um, these medications are not just used in oncology either. The standards would also pertain to anywhere these drugs are being handled, such as urology, rheumatology, and dermatology. Well, let's move on and tackle some more myths. Myth number five, compliance is too complicated. Well, compliance is not too complicated. In reality, compliance is simply based on what you do with what you have. It's the, for it's the form of the hazardous drug that matters. If you receive the hazardous drug in a blister pack, then there's less for you to do. If you need to crush the tablet, then there's more to do. If you're administering an intravenous drug, then there's even more to do. It's about the assessment of risk, and that's the term that's used in 800. So look at how you receive the hazardous drug, and then what you have to do with it before the drug is administered to the patient. The assessment of risk needs to be done at least every 12 months, so annually, to meet the USP 800 standards. And you can find a lot more about details of performing an assessment of risk in Section 2 of USP 800. So to sum it up, compliance may seem complicated, but it's really not. Example, if you're a general contractor on a job site, you'll want your workers to wear hard hats. And if you're an oncologist, you want to protect your staff as well and have them wear PPE. So simply assess where your risk is and how to mitigate it best via policies, procedures, PPE, or training. USP 800 sets clear standards for pharmacy practice. But what about elsewhere at the facility? Does USP 800 only apply to the pharmacy? That's our next polling question. Audience members, please select your response, true or false, does USP 800 only apply to pharmacy? We'll wait a moment for these votes to come in. I see a consensus. You're correct. USP 800 does not only apply to pharmacy. 
It applies to everywhere where hazardous drugs are present. USP 800 was designed to protect everyone in the healthcare system, from the person on the receiving dock to the environmental services worker who's cleaning it up. It's not just pharmacy. And as I mentioned earlier, most people familiar with USP 800 know that the standards apply to drug compounding and manipulation in the pharmacy. What they may not realize is that USP 800 also applies to many other activities, including receipt, dispensing, administration, patient care activities, spills, transportation, and waste. Again, you'll find this information in Section 3 of the USP 800 standards. You know, in my conversations with physicians, I see them really hanging on to this myth because they don't want USP 800 to apply to them. The fact is, is that it's a healthcare occupational safety standard that applies to everyone where, in every setting where the hazardous drugs exist. And even recently, ASCO, the, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, published an article that uh, implied that for on oncologists that they may not need to comply with USP 800. They did this in reference to the definition of compounding, but it's important to remember that compounding is only one section of USP 800. Now that we've covered what USP 800 is and dispelled some of the common myths about it, what can you do to be compliant? You can build a roadmap for achieving compliance by following these three steps. First, read the USP 800 standards. They are readily available online for your review at www.usp.org. Second, audit your current use of hazardous drugs and perform an assessment of risk. As we said earlier, compliance is based upon what you do with what you have. Third, apply the hierarchy of controls published by NIOSH to help you manage the risk. Let's take a closer look at that. Patty, can you walk us through that hierarchy? Well, NIOSH uses a standard approach in any industry, not just medical, not just hazardous drugs, but any industry. They look at this, how do we mitigate risks in any industry? So if you look at the top two things here, elimination and substitution are certainly the most effective way to get rid of risk. But in healthcare, we usually can't do this because we're taking care of patients who may need these drugs, so we need to comply with those. You'll see some engineering controls in the middle, and that means isolating healthcare workers from the hazardous drug itself. So it might be situations like mixing the hazardous drug in the proper environment, or using closed system drug transfer devices, CSTDs, which are recommended when mixing chemotherapy, for example, but required when administering antineoplastics as long as that dosage form can be done that way. Then we have administrative controls. So they guide the way people work, because we could have all the right facilities and all the right other protective mechanisms, but if people aren't using them correctly or aren't being held to that from a compliance standpoint, it's not helping anyone. And then, as we mentioned, you can use personal protective equipment, PPE, such as the appropriate gowns, gloves, and other components to protect yourself. Karen, I bet you have some other things to add as well. Yes, thanks, Patty. So Rich mentioned the importance of doing a hazardous drug audit. In other words, understanding what you do with what you have. One way you might uh, consider doing this is, is looking at the workflow of your hazardous drugs. So how do those hazardous drugs move through your institution? This may start with selection, then move to storage, how they're ordered, how they're dispensed and administered, and how they're being monitored. Consider where the exposure risks are along the way and what you might do to minimize that risk. For example, when should you be wearing gloves? When might you provide a separate storage cabinet or conduct some additional training? Thank you, Karen and Patty. Now let's recap what we've covered today. First, we reviewed and interpreted key sections from USP 800, which illustrate that USP 800 applies to more than just the compounding and administration of hazardous drugs. It sets standards for the safe handling of these drugs from receipt through disposal and every step in between. Second, we've unraveled common myths about USP 800, and we've wrapped up by building an illustrative roadmap to help achieve compliance. Thanks, Patty and Karen, for, discussing, for our discussion. 
I'll turn it back to the Becker's moderator for audience questions today. Awesome. Thank you, Rich, Karen, and Patty for that fantastic presentation. As a reminder to the audience, the session is being recorded and it will be available to you after the event. You can access the recording by using the same link that you used to log into the webinar today. With that, we will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard. We will try to get through as many questions as we can. So the first question that I have and Karen, I will have you take this one. Audience member says, I've heard recently that there's been a definition of compounding that would exclude physician offices from USP 800. Can you tell me more about that? Sure, thank you. This is a great question, and it's a question that I hear a lot. There's been a lot of communication around this. So as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, there's been an article from the American Society of Clinical Oncology that states that many oncology practices when mixing the chemotherapy do not meet the definition of compounding that's in USP 797. So this may be true, um, but it's in regards to compounding sterile preparations, and in 797, it refers to 800. Because of that reference, ASCO is taking the leap that then 800 doesn't apply. However, in the article, they didn't say that 800 doesn't apply. They did say that 800 may not apply. The truth is that USP 800 stands alone, and it's not dependent on USP 797 to be in effect. Oncologists may not be compounding, but what they're doing in preparing chemotherapy is certainly manipulating the hazardous material in a way that's altering it from the way it was originally received from the manufacturer. The handling and manipulation is what makes USP 800 applicable. Whether it's reconstituting a hazardous drug in an IV powder or whether you're splitting a, chemo a chemotherapy tablet, there's a risk of exposure to personnel doing these activities and therefore USP 800 standards would apply. Okay, thanks Karen for expanding on that. The next question is, my state board of pharmacy says I don't have to comply with USP 800. So does this even apply to me? And Patty, I'll have you take this one first. Thanks. Um, there are a few things in play here. First of all, federal agencies can include this in their standards, and they're likely to do so. And one example you can look at right now is the CMS hospital and critical access hospital conditions of participation. You can take a look at them now and you'll see that the current information from USP 797, which is about sterile compounding, it's included in there right now. And the hazardous drug piece prior to 800 coming into effect is included in 797. So that information's in there now. Other federal agencies could also uh, take this since it is a federally or will be on December 1, a federal standard for that. So OSHA or FDA or other agencies could also include that in what they look at. And second, and the question you know, directly relates to the State Board of Pharmacy question that came in, some State Boards of Pharmacy incorporate USP standards by reference as they become official. Others need to use other legislation, and that's often dependent on how the state constitution is written. But there's other regulatory approaches they use for that. Some State Boards have already notified their licensees that they expect compliance, but others are gonna take more time. But I think the most important piece is what I think of as a third issue. This is the protection of patients, the environment, and for us as healthcare professionals. So I'm sure that everyone on the phone today wants to protect your employees from known risk, even if a regulation doesn't say that you have to. And Karen, I bet you have a few things to add here as well. Well, I think, I think a reminder here would be helpful too that USP is not involved in the compliance. They set the standards and the standards are clear but regulatory bodies may or may not hold healthcare entities accountable for compliance with the standards. It's completely within their scope though to choose to inspect or regulate and especially those that are responsible for federal or state occupational safety. The bottom line is, is it's up to each pharmacy, physician practice, hospital, or other healthcare facility to choose what they want to do, how much hazardous exposure they're willing to accept and then any liability that's associated with the results of their choice. 
Thanks, Patty and Karen. The next question is about the go live date. The audience member asks, why has the USB 800 go live date been delayed? And will it get delayed again? Patty, I'll direct this towards you. This is a very common question. USP was published, as I mentioned before, three and a half years ago, February of 2016. And at that time, the original official date, so that's the date it becomes enforceable essentially, was intended to be July of 2018. But in September of 2017, so almost two years ago, USP announced an extension of that date. The reason for that extension was twofold. One, it gave organizations extra time in which to become compliant, but it also, and this is really a key point, made the official date the same as three other USP chapters. So there's going to be four chapters that are targeted to become official December 1st of this year. It's 795 about non-sterile compounding, 797 about sterile compounding, 825, a new chapter on handling radiopharmaceuticals, as well as 800. So this way, all four chapters that have overlapping responsibilities all go into effect the same date, so there's no conflict among them at all. Thanks for clarifying that. The next question is, for my assessment of risk, can I use the same list that my waste hauler uses for hazardous materials? And Patty, I'll have you take that one as well. The short answer is no. They're completely <laughs> different issues. The list that your waste hauler supplies of items that you have to discard differently are those that are hazardous materials. And some of those, but not all of them, are drugs. These are the ones that are hazardous to the environment. So that's the EPA standard. But what we use in 800 is the NIOSH list of hazardous drugs. Those are hazardous drugs that are hazardous to us as healthcare professionals. So you can't use that list from the waste hauler because that's for a different regulation. You need to use the NIOSH list of hazardous drugs to be compliant with 800. Awesome. Thank you so much for clarifying that. The next audience member wants to know how is handling of table one hazardous drugs different from the handling of tables two and three? And Karen, I'll throw this one to you first. You know, actually, I think since Patty covered this in the, in the uh, slides, I'm going to turn this over to you, Patty. Okay, I'd be happy to handle it. Uh, this is what needs to be addressed in the assessment of risk. You don't need to handle all of the drugs on the list as you would injectable antineoplastics, for example. And I think this is probably the biggest barrier from a almost a fear perspective from a lot of organizations because it seems insurmountable, but you have to break this down into small things. So even table one meds, depending on the dosage form, can have alternative containment strategies identified and implemented. And here's an example. Maybe you get methotrexate tablets in unit dose or unit of use. That can cover, because of the packaging and the dosage form that that comes in, that can cover many of the needs for the assessment of risk. But you have to think of how that drug is handled by all the clinicians in the system. Certainly use the chemo gloves, those tested to ASTM, American Society of Testing and Materials Standard D6978. That should be considered. All dosage forms of the meds on table two and three can be included in your assessment of risk. Personally, I'd handle some of the table two meds, such as the immunosuppressants, as I would injectable chemo agents. But that's just my opinion. You may not agree with that, because any drug of any dosage form in table two and three can be handled in the assessment of risk. Many of the others can be evaluated based on your specific situations and needs. That's why each site needs to individually assess these items for an assessment of risk. For example, one organization may get manufactured premix solutions. Other may mix it from vials. Other may do it different ways. So you can't just take one person's assessment of risk and say, I'm going to adopt this. It has to be very specific to your own organization. Now, on the table three meds, many of them are situational hazards. The biggest question I get from this list, from a hospital perspective, is about oxytocin, for example. People ask all the time if it needs to be mixed in a chemo hood. No. When you look at the reason it's on the list, you'll see that it's a risk to the third trimester of pregnancy. So if you get that drug from an FDA-registered outsourcing facility, for example, as a premix, in that case, you're not manipulating it at all. 
So that would be how you'd handle that in your assessment of risk. Do you allow it admixed in the pharmacy? Well, then the risks may be different in the pharmacy than they are from on the OB unit, for example. But once it gets out of the pharmacy in a premixed manner, from a nursing perspective, it may not be any different from a nursing um, area, whether it's coming from a registered outsourcer or whether it's being mixed in the pharmacy. So you have to address those in your own organization as to how you're handling these drugs throughout the whole piece. There's a number of publications and resources available concerning performing an assessment of risk that can be used for guidance in these. Thanks, Patty. That was super helpful, and those are great points for hospitals and health systems to consider. So the next question is, how do I convince team members of the need to change how they do things today? Now, Patty or Karen, do either of you want to take that one? I'll take that one, thanks. You know, <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a tough one. This is kind of where the rubber hits the road, right? Um, I can understand how hard it is to change habits especially regarding ways where we've been working and caring for patients for sometimes many years. However, USP 800 standards are occupational safety standards, and they're in place for us as healthcare workers, and they're regarding changes that may need to be made the way we do things that have to do with how, how uh, we can be protected when we're caring for patients. I think what you might consider one way is to begin with your communication and education to your staff members maybe introducing a hazardous communication policy if you haven't done that already. Introducing that to your staff helps them understand what the risks are with working with hazardous drugs and the importance of keeping themselves and their work environment safe. That would be a great first step. Then maybe begin introducing one change at a time. For, into, for, for instance, maybe wearing gloves when you're unpacking hazardous drugs. Hopefully they'll soon notice that it's not as difficult as it, as it seems and it would have minimal impact on how they treat and care for their patients. Thanks for that question, that's a great one. Of course, thank you for that answer, it's great. The next question is, exactly which organizations have oversight of USP 800 compliance? Well, I think of that as really the other way around. Um, USP standards are established by expert committees, and they're comprised of practitioners. They're published for public comment prior to the final document. In the case of 800, for example, there were two public comment periods, which is really pretty unusual for that kind of situation. And every one of the several thousand comments was reviewed by multiple people multiple times. But once the standard is finalized, it's up to regulators like federal or state agencies or accreditation organizations to incorporate USP standards into their own standards. So from a hospital perspective, for example, there's four deemed status hospital accreditation organizations, the Joint Commission, DNV Healthcare, HVAP, the Healthcare Facilities Accreditation Program, or CIHQ, the Center for Improvement in Healthcare Quality. So hospital folks would look to those to see from an accreditation standard. But then the ambulatory settings, there's a number of ambulatory accreditation organizations that would also incorporate those in their standing. So of course, the whole point here is best practice drives this acceptance over time. That's right, thanks a lot, Patty. As we said earlier in the webinar, USP sets the standards and it's up to other regulatory entities to adopt them and hold those that they regulate accountable. So I encourage you to step, check with your state boards of pharmacy, your state OSHA plans, um, any other state occupa occupational safety entities to see if they have plans to adopt, to inspect, and to regulate USP 800 standards as of December 1st, 2019. Thank you both so much. So one audience member asked, aren't these standards a bit overkill? Patty or Karen, do you oh, have no. any thoughts on that? I guess that's the that? short answer for that. There's certainly <laughs> known risks, and this information has been available for decades. I often refer folks to uh, one article that probably doesn't cross many people's desks. It's from a journal called Mutation Research. Take a look at it. It's freely available online. Uh, from two years ago, there was a meta-analysis done of healthcare workers and chromosomal damage. So that to me, and I'm a skeptic at heart, but that to me really says a lot, and that provides 
a lot of the prior uh, references from the medical literature that's in there. So we have to understand that 800 allows organizations to adjust the compliance method to meet their needs. Again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You don't have to do everything the same way, but you do have to preserve the worker safety issues that we all need to be aware of. For anybody who's any compounding with raw chemical, API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, for the pharmacists out there, of any hazardous drug on the list, or when you're manipulating Table 1 antineoplastic drugs, all the containment strategies and work practices that are detailed in 800 need to be followed. For Table 1 meds that only need to be counted or packaged, or for any dosage form of Table 2 or 3 meds, organizations can establish and implement, that's important of course, effective strategies in concert with the 800 standard. Yeah, I, I have heard from some of the oncologists that I work with that they don't believe there's enough medical evidence to support some of the requirements and especially the containment strategies that are stated in USP 800. They say, you know, we've been doing this for years with no problem. Why do we have to change the way we do things now? And as I said, change is always hard. But I sincerely hope that we don't need to look for proof of harm in our own workplace to begin to implement change. Whether you agree with the medical evidence or not, it's the duty of a business owner to keep their employees safe. And we have a duty as healthcare workers to inform our staff of the risks and do all that we can to keep them and ourselves safe from exposure. Um, thank you, Patty and Karen. That concludes today's presentation. Today's session was recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log in today, to today's webinar to access the recording. I want to thank Patty, Karen, and Rich for their excellent presentation and Cardinal Health for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.